Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about population genetics in regards to uh, topic um, 7.4 for AP Bio. So let's go ahead and see. Uh, here we have a population of lizards. And when we talk about evolution and a population evolving, um, there are a couple different ways or mechanisms that a population can evolve or change over time. So you may have already heard about or learned about natural selection, but there's also sexual selection, mutations, genetic drift, and genetic drift has two examples or two types of genetic drift. We have the bottleneck effect as well as the founder effect. And then there's gene flow. So all of these are mechanisms or ways that populations can change over time or evolve. So let's go ahead and just discuss, well, what does it mean to evolve? So the definition is evolution is a change in allele frequencies in a population over generations or over time. And so uh, let's go ahead and talk about those alleles. So here we have our population of lizards and here are their genes or their alleles. And when we focus on just those, what we see is all of these alleles within this population make up what we call a gene pool. So in this gene pool, there are 24 alleles total. And when we count them, we find that 12 of the 24 are dominant alleles, which make the frequency or how often that dominant allele shows up in the gene pool is 50% or 0.5. Then the frequency of the recessive allele in this gene pool is also 0.5 or 50%, 12 out of 24. So when we talk about evolution being a change in the allele frequency over the generations, what we're going to see is if these alleles, these dominant and recessive alleles in this lizard population, if they stay at 0.5 and 0.5 generation after generation, then the population is not evolving in in respect to whatever that gene is, um, whatever A codes for. Maybe it's uh, I almost said fur. Maybe it's like scales, like the color of their um, of their of their scales. Okay, so let's go ahead though and look at uh, an example of natural selection and how natural selection can be a mechanism uh, for evolution. One way that a population can adapt to its environment. Now, keep in mind it's a population and not an individual. Okay, so when we look at the initial population, this is our population that had the allele frequency of. Uh, the dominant allele was 0.5 and the recessive allele was 0.5, 50%, 50%. So let's pretend the environment changes. And I don't know if you can see, but I have the, um, like the green on the hills kind of faded away. Okay, we can watch that again. So you can see here the environment is changing and that green has kind of faded. Where now maybe that green phenotype has a low fitness and it's the brown phenotype lizards that are selected for and have that selective advantage due to environmental pressures, right? Or so, um, yeah, selective pressures from the environment. So in the second generation, you can see how there's been an increase in that brown phenotype and therefore an increase in the frequency of that recessive allele. So if we were to measure this again, uh, to keep things even, I still just kept 12 lizards, so we'd have the 24 alleles. So now we can see, though, that the frequency of the dominant and recessive alleles have changed over generations. Over time, the allele frequency is changing. And in this example, it's due to natural selection, survival of the fittest, with some phenotypes having a, um, giving a higher fitness than others. Now, when we talk about um, as far as like adaptive evolution and a population evolving to like fit their environment, uh, natural selection does that. Uh, but there's a second mechanism of evolution that's very similar to natural selection, and that is non-random mating or sexual selection. Uh, so when we look at an example of this, let's go ahead and take these two male lizards and let's pretend they have eyelashes. And truthfully, the reason I chose eyelashes is my son has a crested gecko as a pet that has like like eyelashes on it. So they are real things that exist on, uh, I don't know, rept I don't know if geckos are reptiles. Um, we're on a reptile, right? So anyway, so now here they have some eyelashes. So let's pretend that this, uh, a female is going to choose her mate. 
And out of these two choices, let's pretend she finds the male with the longer eyelashes uh, more attractive. And that's the male she chooses to mate with. This is non random mating. Um, it is due to sexual selection. It's the female who is choosing who to uh, make offspring with. And so when they have offspring, I want to also point out that their offspring are going to also um, have variation. So when we look at these offspring, the offspring, because it's from a sexually reproducing population, uh, the offspring will have variation because of crossing over, independent assortment, and random fertilization. And so therefore, the offspring are even up for natural selection or sexual selection as well. So here, um, I also want to point out as a reminder that fitness of an organism is determined by reproductive success. So even if that top male lizard is really good at finding food and camouflaging from predators and great at surviving, if he never gets to have offspring or he has a low amount of offspring, he does not have high fitness. It's the male who is chosen to reproduce whose genes are now in the next generation. So out of these two males, the short eyelash male has low fitness, and then the male with um, longer eyelashes uh, has high fitness. And so this can drive evolution of populations. It can change the allele frequencies. Over time, the alleles for longer eyelashes will continually be selected for, and therefore you will see a shift in that population to have more and more uh, dominant alleles, or I don't know if they're dominant or recessive, uh, to have the alleles for long eyelashes as shown. So this type of sexual selection is intersexual selection, um, often called like female choice, um, and can drive the uh, evolution of a population. But we also have a different type of sexual selection where it's um, the same sex competing uh, so that would be like a male and a male competing to get to reproduce with the female. So this also uh, cha can change the allele frequencies in a population. And this type of mating is not a random event. Uh, the more like alpha or dominant male, the, like the stronger male, the, the male that's like better at uh, competing is going to be the one who gets to reproduce. And so that is not a random process but it can change allele frequency so much so that over time, you can see this sexual dimorphism and a difference in males and females uh, within populations. Now, it's not always true. There's some birds uh, or some animals that you can't tell, tell a male from a female. Um, and maybe in those populations, sexual selection isn't a factor, uh, but in ones where it is, you will start to see changes um, between males and females in their phenotypes. Okay, so let's go ahead though. Um, both of these examples of natural selection and sexual selection have been non-random events, right? Both were determined by fitness and reproductive success. But evolution or changes in allele frequencies can also be driven by just random events where your fitness doesn't matter. <laughs> so let's go ahead and see. We have mutations, which are random events that are constantly occurring. We have genetic drift and the two parts of genetic drift. And then we have gene flow. So we're going to talk about each of these. So let's start with mutations. So here's that initial population. And let's pretend a mutation shows up that changes how these genes are expressed. And let's pretend the heterozygote now, instead of um, being all green with that dominant uh, allele, let's pretend it ends up being a situation of co-dominant. Now I'm totally making this up, right? Like I used paint to make this lizard. Um, but let's pretend that now this new phenotype um, because of some mutation and how the genes are being expressed um, or even the sequence of the genes that are changing the proteins, et cetera. We have this new phenotype show up in the population. And in this example, this phenotype confers or gives high fitness. So while the mutation is random, uh, mutations are the ultimate source of variation. They create new phenotypes. Now those new phenotypes can be acted on by natural selection. Now natural selection requires variation and with mutations, they create that variation that then could give high fitness, low fitness, or just have a neutral effect on phenotype, right? Like if you had a, a mutation that changed your fingerprints, that wouldn't have an impact on your fitness and your reproductive success. 
Okay, so here what we see though over time, if this um, heterozygote had an advantage at surviving, you can see how the gene uh, frequency, the allele frequency, not gene, sorry, the allele frequency is going to change over the generations. And so we started with a 0.5 and 0.5, and now it's 0.25 and 0.75. So the allele frequency has changed. So again, mutations are random events that can then be acted on by natural selection. So, um, okay, so that is the summary, mutation results in genetic variation, which provides phenotypes on which natural selection acts. Now, speaking of the heterozygote um, having a high fitness, this is actually called a heterozygote advantage. And I just wanted to touch bases on it real fast. And so uh, there's a trait called sickle cell anemia, and it comes down to a mutation that is in the hemoglobin gene. So a person with a normal uh, gene or allele uh, would create normal hemoglobin shapes with round red blood cells. However, this mutation is a missense mutation and it causes the hemoglobin to form straight chains within the blood cell. And that causes the blood cell to be um, like a sickle shape or like a um, stretched out shape as you can see here. And so let's take three different possibilities. Uh, let's pretend a person is homozygous for normal hemoglobin. Um, they're going to have normal blood cells, normal round blood cells. And let's pretend a person is homozygous for the sickle cell allele. Well, then all of their genes have the directions to build that mutated uh, hemoglobin molecule. And now they have that like straight chain. Now, the cool thing or interesting thing here is that these alleles are co-dominant. So if a person is a heterozygote, they will actually have half of their DNA or half of their chromosome. Like if it comes in a pair, one of them will say, hey, let's go ahead and make the normal round uh, hemoglobin shapes and you have normal red blood cells. But their other chromosome in their diploid pair says, hey, let's make sickle cell shape. It has that mutation. So some of the red blood cells will have a sickle shape and some will have a round shape. So now when we talk about uh, the consequences for this, having sickle cell um, causes like I always think of it as like traffic jams in your blood vessels, makes it very difficult for your blood to flow and to carry oxygen to your organs and your tissues. Um, and so having like homozygous uh, for sickle cell is actually low fitness, makes it very difficult to survive until reproductive age. Um, and then now we have uh, being a heterozygote is survivable. Uh, you have enough normal shaped red blood cells where you can survive. You may have some health consequences and some health problems, but um, you can survive until reproductive age, which is what fitness is dependent on. Did you live long enough to get to reproduce? Now, um, in areas where malaria is very common, malaria is spread by mosquitoes. And uh, a person who is homozygous for normal hemoglobin, actually, if they contract malaria, have low fitness. Uh, they, it's very difficult to survive. If a person, though, is heterozygote and they contract malaria, they, uh, for some reason, the malaria parasite does not reproduce well in sickle shaped blood cells. So this person as a heterozygote will have some consequences of catching malaria, but will survive. So actually being a heterozygote in areas where malaria is a selective, like an environmental pressure, um, they actually will have high fitness. So this is an example of the heterozygote advantage. Sometimes being heterozygote gives you um, the high fitness phenotype in a particular population. Okay, so uh, let's go back to these mutations and kind of just summarize real fast. Oh, no, sorry. So now we're going to talk about uh, genetic drift. And so again, genetic drift is a random process. Um, and with this, we have the two kinds. We have the bottleneck effect as well as the founder effect. So let's go ahead and talk about the bottleneck effect. So um, let's pretend that there is this like natural disaster that occurs and a massive forest fire happens. Um, and in that second generation, a whole lot of the original population died off and there's only a few survivors. Now who survived was not dependent on fitness. It was not based on phenotype, it was random who survived. And here we see it just so happens the survivors were homozygous dominant lizards, just by chance. 
And so therefore, you can see how that allele frequency changed. Now, the dominant allele is 100% of the gene pool instead of 0.5, and the recessive allele is 0% of the gene pool. This was a random event. It was not adaptive evolution. It was not natural selection. It was not due to, to fitness or phenotype. So in bottlenecks, um, a bottleneck effect, it occurs when a population size is greatly reduced for at least one generation. And when you reduce that population to a very small size, all of those individuals who don't survive, their variation is lost, right? They're not alive to pass on that their traits. And so um, when we look at a real life example of the elephant seals, so back in, like before the 1800s, late 1800s, uh, elephant seals numbered about 150,000. And then they were hunted to near extinction for their blubber because their fat was used as oil in lamps uh, before we had electricity. So by the year 1890, we were down to only 20 elephant seals left in um, like a lot of them are in California, Alaska, like along the coast, we were down to 20. So imagine 150,000 elephant seals reduced to just 20 individuals. Now it's those 20 individuals that then mated and reproduced. And so now you can see their descendants, whatever genetic variation is in their descendants came from just those original 20. So here, if we have a population of elephant seals, and a lot of them are hunted, whoever survives that very small number, you've lost the genetic diversity. And now whatever is left reproduces and is responsible for that variation. So we call this a bottleneck effect because if you think about it, like there's only gonna be like a few survivors. Oops, sorry, there's that one. And so when we look at this in graphical form, initially you have a good population size, high genetic variation within that population. It experiences a bottleneck and then you have a reduction in population size, but also a reduction in genetic variation. And from that moment, if, the variation is too little, like there's not enough, like this puts the species at extinct, I mean, at risk of extinction. If they lack the variation to survive a changing environment, they very well could go extinct or they could rebound. And as they rebound over time and recover and their population size increases, their sources of new variation would come from mutations because mutations would be the only way to create new alleles. Sure, you can have, um, a variation in offspring from crossing over and independent assortment, but that's not creating new alleles. That's just shuffling things around. Okay, and then the other type of genetic drift is the founder effect. And in the founder effect, it's where a few individuals um, will maybe leave a main population and they'll migrate to a new area. And then they found that new population and they start to reproduce. And um, basically, if you have a small group leave and start a new population, they're not bringing all the variation, all the alleles of their original population with them. They only bring the alleles they carry. So here in this example, I just happen to have three homozygous recessive individuals migrate, which totally changed that allele frequency. But in reality, we have a couple examples of real life founder effects. So um, one of them you can think about, let's start with the finches in the Galapagos Islands. You have a finch population um, from like South America land in the Galapagos, 500 miles off the coast. And the, only, like, the finches that landed there, whatever genes they had with them, that was the founding population. And then natural selection can like act on a certain phenotypes. And they either survive or they don't, they reproduce or they don't. And then as like some finch move to a different island with a different habitat, whatever alleles are brought to the new location, like that is the founding population and then they'll reproduce, et cetera. Now we have the Vikings. So I, I saw a documentary maybe a decade ago uh, that talked about uh, people in Iceland, they were able to uh, sequence their human genome, like sequence their DNA, and they trace the majority of the native Iceland population to eight Vikings from a thousand years ago. So you can think about a Viking ship landing on the island uh, Iceland and staying and reproducing and then having descendants. So now a thousand years later, um, the genes of those original 
uh, Vikings brought to the island started that population. And then a cool example, which hopefully if you're in a bio class, your teacher can talk more about, is we have the Blue People of Troublesome Creek. So the story is in the 1800s, there was a French immigrant. He was an orphan and he uh, immigrated to um, America and he ended up settling in a small town up in the mountains in Appalachia. I think it's Kentucky. And um, he actually carried an allele that changed uh, something with his enzymes in his blood cells. And um, it basically made his blood and his skin appear blue. And so, um, but it was like a recessive allele. But if you have a very small population in the top of a mountain and you're kind of like geographically isolated from others, there's not a lot of like movement in and out. You start to mate with each other. And if you are heterozygous for this, um, trait, and then you mate with another heterozygous individual, uh, you have a 25% chance that a person, your offspring will be homozygous recessive. And what they started to see was that there were more and more of the population experiencing this homozygous recessive phenotype of having like a blue appearance. But it really was from that founding population bringing that allele, and then it's staying within that small population and kind of spreading and increasing in frequency. So the key thing about the found or about genetic drift, uh, the founder effect and the bottleneck bottleneck effect. So let's put this here. Is that they are um, uh, really occur in small populations is where they have their biggest impact. I mean, generally speaking, you lose variation in the in genetic drift. So in the founder effect, we can see here on the left, if you have a large population and a few move, that allele frequency does change, but it's random, not based on fitness. Um, and you lose the uh, variation that you would see in the original population. Then if you look at like the bottleneck effect, uh, where you have a lot of individuals not survive, so you have only a few survivors, whatever genes are in those survivors will make up that next generation's gene pool. And so in both cases, small populations are affected greatly by genetic drift and there's a reduction in genetic variation. But again, it is random and has nothing to do with phenotypes or high or low fitness. Okay, and then our, oops, let's see. So genetic drift is a random non-selective. It has nothing to do with selective pressures from the environment that occurs and it occurs in small populations. Okay, and then our last mechanism, our last random occurrence, our last way that populations can evolve by random events is gene flow. And gene flow basically means migration. So here, when individuals move in or out of a population, they're bringing their alleles with them. And if evolution is a change in allele frequencies, you can imagine that if new alleles arrive, that may change the new individuals bringing their alleles arrive, may change allele frequencies. Or if individuals leave, then they're like taking their alleles with them. That could also change allele frequencies. So here, let's say we have our original lizard population with 0.5 and 0.5 for the dominant and recessive alleles. And then you have um, some new individuals move into an area and it just so happens that they're homozygous recessive. Because again, this is not based on fitness. It's a random event, what alleles they're bringing with them. What we see here is that the allele frequency has changed. The frequency of the dominant allele, if I counted all of these um, individuals, I have 18 lizards here, but so 36 genes, 36 alleles in this gene pool, and 12 of them are the dominant allele. So we went from 0.5 to now 0.33 for the dominant allele frequency. And then over here for the recessive allele frequency, we changed from 0.5 to now 0.67. So there's a change in the alleles in the gene pool, but it had nothing to do with natural selection. It was random, but it still caused evolution to occur because evolution is a change in allele frequencies over time. Okay, so uh, to summarize, here's my last slide. Uh, basically, not all mechanisms of evolution are uh, adaptive. So while natural selection and sexual selection are adaptive evolution, there are traits that confer or give high fitness. Um, we have some 
that are random ways that populations evolve, that allele frequencies change over time randomly. And that would be your mutations that randomly occur, genetic drift, which is made up of the bottleneck effect and the founder effect. And then we have gene flow or migration. Those three uh, will change allele frequencies over time or over generations, but through random events, um, not uh, like adaptive. Okay. All right. So that is it on population genetics. And this hopefully will set the stage for our discussion on Hardy Weinberg and how we can mathematically calculate whether or not a population is evolving. All right, great job.